wonderful Christmas season. We did. I hope that you did as well. Uh, I know Christmas can kind of be a tough time for some people because some for some folks it's a lonely time, a season of disappointment sometimes. I want you to know this morning as we gather together that you come to a Lord who loves you more than you can imagine. Amen. You know, you may say, man, Brother Mike, I have been kind of a failure this week. I want you to know God loves you as you come through this door this morning. Let him fill your heart with his love and with his presence. Just a couple of announcements I want to make, <clears throat> both of them uh, with regard to Wednesday night. Our Bible study is back up. We took a week off. Uh, back up and running full speed Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Brother Matt uh, does a great job of teaching, as you can imagine, if you're not one of the Wednesday nighters. Uh, come and try this out. I encourage you. It's, uh, Wednesday night is one of my favorite times. It's the, the youth does a couple songs of worship, and then Brother Matt just sits here or stands here and just lays it out, and it is good stuff. Come and be with us on Wednesday night. The youth are going to have their big Christmas bash Wednesday night. Uh, if you're one of those youth, or if you're of that age and you haven't been coming to youth, please come to the Christmas party, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, right here, be here or be square, I think is what they say. Is that right, Kobe? Yeah, okay, good deal. Hey, and the last thing I got for you, our pastor is turning 40, I'm not sure, I think it's 48 this week. All right, that, that may not, I, I know it's in that area somewhere. Uh, he ain't 50 yet. He's not my age yet. <laughs> hey, hold it down back there. <laughs> hey, but we're going to take up a love offering for his birthday on the way out today. I haven't talked to the ushers about this, but if the ushers would kind of man a bucket at the door, if you want to be a blessing to Brother Matt, throw a couple bucks in the bucket on the way out or a five or if you want to take him out to dinner, if you want to take me out to dinner for Matt's birthday, that's okay too. Don't matter to me. We will celebrate and talk about it. We can do that. We'll talk good. We'll talk good about it. But anyway, it's good to be here this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, you're always a blessing. Man, I love to see your faces. I love to see my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know, man, we, we're, we're so thankful. Uh, we want to just pour our love out into you, pour the love of Christ into you this morning, and, and we just want you to know we are glad that you chose to come and be here. If you're one of the regulars, man, it's so good just to see your face this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just come to you, and I thank you so much for this day, the day that you have made, Father. Lord, you are a God of grace, and in spite of who we are, Father, you pour your love into us. I pray that as we gather here to, together today, Father, we want we just want to feel your love. We want to feel your presence. Father, many of us have had a week maybe of struggle, of, of tough times here, Father. And, and Lord, I just want to be encouraged by your love. And let, let them know that you love every one of us here, Father. Regardless of the direction that we come from, that you're here with me and I'm here as well. Father, I pray your blessing upon Brother Matt. Give him the words to speak this morning. How he will hear from you and from him. I pray for this praise and worship team, Lord, that as they lift up their voices and Father, that we would glorify you, Father, as they're here to lift up your holy name, to be in your presence. I ask these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Y'all want to stand with us this morning?
you have a need in the room this morning, I just want you to raise your hand. Maybe a family need, a personal need. We're just going to do this a little different as they continue to play. We're going to have a word of prayer and ask our wonder-working God to do what only he can do in people's lives today. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We're thankful that there's nothing too hard for you to perform. And so, Lord, we come this morning with various needs. Some come with broken hearts, broken lives, broken families. Some this morning are worried about loved ones who are sick. God, there's financial needs in the room. Just whatever it is in this moment, Lord, as we lift our hands toward heaven, we believe in you. Father, our faith sometimes is weak, sometimes we waver. But God, we trust you today for that prodigal son or daughter who's gone astray. Lord, we pray that you do the work that only you can. We pray that you'd heal the sick. God, that you'd mend the broken. That your spirit would flow through this place today and work in lives. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to go ahead and kick the kids out real quick. All the children can go. We just need to make room. It's not that we don't love you and not that we don't want you here every split second that we can possibly be around you, but please get out of here <laughs> and make some room. Have fun in kids' church. Uh, thank you for being here today, by the way. Didn't our youth group just knock it out of the park? They are doing such a good job bringing Blake along. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> Helping him with his vocal skills and piano. Now he's doing a great job with the kids and I appreciate that. That's what we get to hear on Wednesday night. So if you're not here on Wednesday, seriously, you need to come just for them. Come listen to them on Wednesday and then leave. You don't have to stay and hear me out. But uh, they do that every Wednesday and love to hear them play and sing and appreciate it so much. We're going to ask God's blessing over this offering. Father, please bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. How'd you all like that? You guys can take it up now. I totally didn't practice with them for the offering. Kind of forgot about that part till this morning. So give it up for them. Kobe just picked up the bass like a few weeks ago. So give it up. You ought to be a little louder for the youth band. Come on. Very young. That's right. Hey, hold on now. Y'all clean up your freaking mess. Get this garbage out of my way for crying out loud. I got to do everything around here. All right, go to John chapter 21. I feel like I'm at home yelling at kids. It's awesome. John chapter 21. Man, I'm kind of sad, honestly, that today's the last Sunday of 2021. And we're in John 21. Man, can you believe that? It literally just dawned on me in that second. But uh, I, am, I, I have enjoyed this series this year. Um, called the Jesus Revolution, and um, we've just, we've spent 52 weeks in the Gospels, well, I should say 51, because Mike, on Mother's Day, when I was sick with COVID, preached a Mother's Day message, and just, man, just blew the whole thing. Otherwise, we spent 50, almost a whole year in the Gospels, and uh, anyway, that was an awesome message, I'm just teasing him. He was making me sound a lot older than I am, so... The jokes have just begun. 
what people forget is that I get to talk after they do. And so, anyway, but at his age, I can't be too surprised that he's forgetting my age. Well, that went over about like your jokes did, didn't it, Mike? <laughs> All right, whatever. Go to John 21. We're in the final installment of this series, The Jesus Revolution, and I hope it's been, uh, I hope it's been meaningful for you. I hope you've learned some things that have helped you grow closer to Jesus this year. I know that God's used it to bring people into a relationship with himself. I know that he's, he's helped some of us uh, who struggled to find freedom even after we were saved. Uh, it's funny that often Jesus saves us from bondage and then we sort of get wrapped back up in it in different ways, whether it be religious bondage or some sort of self-righteous, you know, nonsense. We start thinking we're better than other people. Uh, but, uh, but I hope that through seeing Jesus, you've found a new sense of freedom and a new sense of closeness in your walk with him. John 21 is the capstone though. I'm telling you, look in verse number one. It's after these things, it says, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. I guess they weren't worth mentioning, but anyway. <laughs> no, <laughs> names everybody else. How would you like to be those two disciples? They're like, hey, John, we were there too, bro. But anyway, <laughs> Simon Peter, verse 3, says, uh, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are too, we're with you. Then they went out and immediately got into a boat, and that night they caught nothing. When the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish. So this morning, we're going to stop right there. I'm going to cover the whole chapter with the help of God, uh, but I'm going to title this thought this morning because of the fact that this is the the capstone of our series, because of the fact that we're in John 21 at the end of 2021, and because of the fact that we are entering into a new year. I'm preaching on uh, the subject this morning, entering a new dimension. Father, we do pray that your blessing would be on us. As we gather around your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you'd fill us with your spirit. Lord, we ask that you'd meet every need. Thank you for how you've met with us thus far, but we pray you'd continue the work that you've started in our hearts. Be glorified in this place, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So John 21, when we get to this chapter, we find that Jesus has accomplished and completed redemption's plan. He came into the world to die as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, and he's done that by the time we get to John 21. He's fulfilled and completed his purpose. He's been resurrected in power and in all of his glory. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. And so in John chapter 21, he's about to ascend. He walked the earth, the Bible tells us, for 40 days after his resurrection. Uh, And in John 21, he's now about to ascend back to his throne in heaven to be with the Father. What this means for the disciples is that they're about to enter into a new era. They're about to enter a new dimension. Because for the last three and a half years, their lives have been completely consumed with following Jesus step by step. Everywhere Jesus went, the disciples went. Where he walked, they walked. When he ate, they ate. When he slept, they slept. They watched and witnessed as he healed the blinded eyes. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. They witnessed as he walked on water and calmed the storm. They had been with him every single step, lockstep for three and a half years, but now he's leaving. And as far as they're concerned, it was for good this time. You remember last week we looked at his words in John chapter 16 and verse number 16, and I'm completely ignoring the fact that I've skipped chapter 17 through 20, but anyway. Uh, But last week we looked in John chapter 16, verse 16, where Jesus said, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. So from their perspective, Jesus has gone away as he promised. He's returned in power and, and resurrection, but now he's leaving them for good. And so really, they're, they're, they're 
really, in a way, in a sense, they're sort of lost. They don't know what they're going to do in life. They've committed everything to follow Jesus. They went through these ups and downs of, of believing that he was the Messiah and then hearing the criticism and witnessing as they offered him up on mock trial and found him guilty and nailed him to a cross. And, and this man that they believed to be their, their all in all and their, their, their I am and the Messiah revealed was, was crucified. And so they went and they plummeted into this this depth of despair that they'd never been in before but three days later he rolled the stone back and resurrected from the dead and and they got the word from Mary that Jesus is alive so then they were invigorated and empowered and then he appeared to them and they saw him and witnessed him in his resurrected state but now he's telling them I'm leaving I'm not going to stay I know that you've gone through some ups and downs and some hardships and some hurt but I want you to understand that I've got to go away for good this time and so in their mind, they don't know what to do. They're sort of at a loss. And from, from here on out, uh, they would have to live their lives on this thread of hope contained in that promise that, listen, even though I've gone away and I've come back and conquered death, I'm going away again, but I'm going to come back again and receive it myself. They didn't know it at the time, but this wasn't the end for them. It felt like it. It felt like this saga, this story was was coming to a close, but this wasn't the end for the disciples. In fact, it was the beginning of something magnificent. Now, here is a very interesting historical shift that's taking place in John chapter 21, not only for the disciples, but for everyone who would come and place their faith in Jesus to follow him as a disciple at any point in history. Remember in his, in his prayer in John 17, well, maybe you wouldn't remember because we didn't study it, but if you had, if I had covered that chapter... You would have seen that when Jesus prayed for his disciples, we call it the high priestly prayer. Jesus prayed for his disciples, and in the midst of that prayer, he said, I'm not praying for these only, but also for all those who will come after them. In other words, he said, I'm, he was praying for you, and he was praying for me, and, and he's telling the disciples, now, listen, I know this feels like the end, and I know that this feels like the conclusion, and I know you don't really understand what's going to happen next, or how you're going to take the next step, or where we go from here, but I want you to know that what I'm doing is not the end, it's the beginning of a new era. This is something that you've never seen before. I'm not just going to dwell with you, I'm going to dwell in you. My spirit is going to abide in you, and what I've done in this world, and what you've witnessed me do in the flesh, he said, greater works than these will you do, because I'm going to the Father. So what seemed like a giant period in their lives, what seemed like a grand crescendo in the end for, their, for this story, Jesus said, really, I'm just getting started. And so I want you to sort of walk with me through John chapter number 21. That was introduction one. This is introduction number two to John chapter 21, and then we'll get to a message here in just a little bit. So notice in verse number three, I told you a moment ago that the disciples sort of felt like everything was over, Right? I mean, can you understand? They left everything. Can you imagine quitting your job? I just stopped there because that sounded like a good place to stop for a second. <laughs> can you imagine quitting your job and, and, and leaving everything behind? Houses, land, family, friends, they left everything to follow Jesus. And again, they did that for three and a half years. They did everything he did. He went ever, they went everywhere. He went and now he's telling them, hey, y'all, you're on your own. I'm going to be, where well, we love this one, I'm going to be with you in spirit. Right? That's what he said, essentially. Now, it means a lot more coming from Jesus. You got it? All right. It means a lot more coming from Jesus. Y'all know how bad I get distracted, right? But when Jesus was about to leave them, he said, I'm going to leave my spirit with you. Right? I'm going to be with you. It's okay, y'all look up here. It was just a breath mint or something. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my spirit with you. But for them, again, that, that probably didn't mean a whole lot. You ever had anybody say, hey, look, I can't go, but I'll be with you in spirit. That's probably how they took that. So notice this. In verse number three, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Now, I've always liked this guy. When I get to John 21, verse number three, I really like this guy. Because he thinks like I think. I don't know what to do. Well, well, there ain't nothing else to do. Let's go fishing. Amen? What are you doing today? I don't know. What are you going to do? Well, let's go fishing. Ah, come on, guys. 
I thought the guys would just at least get on board with that. Let's try it like this. Uh, ladies, oh, let's go crocheting or something, right? Whatever. <laughs> let's go to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> Woo, revival done broke out up in here this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You said the right thing, man. Hobby Lobby. Yeah. Now they won't pay attention to the rest of the sermon, but that's okay. Y'all hang with me, okay? So, so brother, Simon Peter, man, he don't know what to do. Now, there was more to this statement, obviously, than he was just going fishing. Fishing was his trade. And so when he made that statement, I'm going fishing, he said, I don't know what to do, but just to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to what I'm comfortable with. I don't know how to do this whole ministry thing. My ministry's been contained in him. Everything he did, I just sort of tagged along, and if he told me to do it, I did it. But now he's leaving, so I'm going to go back to fishing. So he went back to fishing, and by the way, here's the power of influence. The other disciples went with him. They said, hey, brother, you quit. <laughs> We're out of here, too. You've always been the loudmouth spokesman, brother, so we don't know who's even going to talk for us. So if you're going fishing, we're going fishing. And so they went fishing. But then notice, in verse number 3, it says, uh, they caught nothing. So in verse number 5, when Jesus shows up, he said, uh, well, here's how he said it. He said, children, you have any food, but here's what he meant. Hey, how's that going for you? How's that working out? Look, you went back to what you know. I get it. Your comfort zone. You know how to dwell in that, in that, in that realm. You, that's your, sort of your headspace. It's what you're, you're handy with it. You're a good fisherman. I get it. But uh, man, how's that going after all? You, you went back. You decided just to sort of stay in this spot where you're not going to grow. How's that working out? Well, we ain't catching nothing. Now, look, they didn't even catch a little perch. They caught nothing. It says, and these men, they were professional fishermen, like me. You know what I'm saying? Like, they were really good. That's what they did. It was, their, it was their job. It was their trade. They owned it, right? Simon Peter and his brother owned a fishing business, right? Not like a charter fishing thing, like we go out, and, you know, in the Gulf and go fishing. I'm saying they caught fish for a living and sold fish at the market. They were good fishermen, but they were catching nothing. So, so notice this. In verse number six, he said to them, Jesus said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, you got to keep this in mind, all right? If you back up, if you back up, in verse 4, it says, When the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So, so notice that, that at this point, they didn't even realize it was Jesus. As far as they're concerned, this is just some random guy giving them fishing advice from the bank. They didn't know it was Jesus. But they were desperate. Now, I'll be honest, I've been fishing enough, I'm, look, I, I hunt, I fish, I do stuff that men do, and I know this, I was supposed to get a little chuckle, dang, I knew today would be a little chill because it's the day after Christmas and some of y'all drank too much eggnog yesterday, but try to keep up, all right? These guys were professional fishermen, and if you've never done this before, I don't recommend that you do it. But if you, if you know somebody that's a good, good at fishing, good, well, good at anything, take a guy. All right, let's, let's re-sort let's re, uh, of calibrate this scenario. Take a guy that's good at anything and give him advice on it unsolicited. <laughs> take, uh, apply that to any genre, any trade, anything you can think of. Give someone unsolicited advice. Heck, it don't have to be a guy. Try to give a woman unsolicited advice. Try to give a woman advice, Period. She might even ask and then still not want it. Is my wife in here? Okay, no. Anyway, like I was saying, she might ask and still not want it. Women. <laughs> so here they are. Don't even know it's Jesus, and this guy's going, hey, why don't you try fishing from the right side of the boat? I'd have been like, do yeah, that'll work. <laughs> what? Hey, Andrew, why didn't I think of that? Who he told us to fish on the right side. Gee, we've been fishing on the left side of the boat. Let's shift eight feet to the right and see what, what happens. But they were in bad shape. And by the way, I think this is the difference between confidence and arrogance right here. They were confident in their trade, 
But they weren't so arrogant as to say, you know what, shoot, nothing else is working. And so they did it. Started fishing through the net on the right side of the boat. Says they caught a hundred and some odd, I forgot how many fish they caught. But, uh, but they couldn't even drag the nets into land. They caught so many fish, they couldn't even drag the nets into land. Here's a little parenthetical truth for you. Sometimes we got to be willing to try new methods. Don't be so prideful. Don't be so arrogant. If what you're doing is not working, why don't you find something somebody else is doing that is working and try that? Jesus said, throw the net on the right side of the boat. They could have said, dude, look, hey, just keep starting your little fire over there. You know, keep, keep, keep spinning that stick, trying to get a spark. Go ahead, just keep, let us keep fishing. You mind your own business. They could have definitely done that, but they didn't. And, and because they listened, it worked. And by the way, after they followed his advice, they didn't, they did, then figured out, they then figured out that this was Jesus on the shore. Once they followed his advice, I'm telling you, there's a nugget of truth right there. Once they took his advice, then they realized all along, man, that was better than a good idea. That was a God idea. That wasn't just a good suggestion. That was a God suggestion. God was in the midst of that. And because they were willing to step out and, and try to employ some different method than what they had used before, it worked and God blessed them. And then in verse number 14, we see this, all right? It says in verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, now I got to thinking about that because, because I thought this has to be here for a reason, right? It has to be there for a reason. God didn't just write things like, he, don't, he ain't like, look, God, God ain't like me. He doesn't chase rabbit trails. He don't just talk about random nonsense. If God took the time to inspire John to write these words, in his book, then there's, there's got to be a purpose. So I got to digging into that. And I thought, well, the first time he appeared to his disciples, he equipped them with a new catalyst in the person of the Holy Spirit. If you notice in chapter 20 and verse number 19, this was the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. It says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled, were assembled for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and says the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the first time that Jesus appeared to his disciples in his glorified state, in his post-resurrection state. He gave them a new catalyst. I told you a moment ago that up until this point, their lives have been contained and consumed by following Jesus, just physically looking where he's going. We're going that way. He said, now you still need someone to guide you, and I'm going away, so I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to put my spirit in you. Remember, again, oftentimes we tell people, I'm going to be with you in spirit, and that don't mean much. But when Jesus said, I'm going to be with you in spirit, that meant everything. And he came, he came back and fulfilled that promise when it says that he breathed on them. When I think about that statement, I remember the words of Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 7 when God uh, uh, created man in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says that he formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This was life-giving breath. He gave them power. He invigorated them. He gave them the unction and the anointing that they needed to carry forth the task that he set before them. So in the first appearance after his resurrection, he gave them a new catalyst. In the second appearance after his resurrection, he offered them needful confirmation. Look what happened in verse 24 of chapter 20. It says, Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And he said to them, Unless I see his hands, and I'm able to feel the nail prints, and put my finger into, his, into the nail prints, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, the, the disciples were again inside. So this is the second time that Jesus appears to the disciples. And it says Thomas was with them this time. The doors being shut. And Jesus stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So in the second appearance, he gave them a confirmation. He gave them the affirmation that he was everything that he claimed to be. And I appreciate the fact that Jesus was even willing to verify this to Thomas. Because Thomas ticks me off. He does. We know him. Think about this. How would you like to live the rest of your life? How would you like to live the rest of known time with the moniker Doubting Thomas? So everybody calls him. I'd hate to have such a negative characteristic that I was, like that became part of my title, Doubting Dudley. You know what I'm saying? I would hate to know that there was something about me that was j- just, just so prominent, some negative, some negative aspect. And I'm standing here actually thinking right now, oh, maybe, maybe there is. But I'd hate to know that there was something about me that was so glaring, just this obnoxious, you know what I'm saying? Like just, 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 just this albatross that became part of who you are, doubting Thomas. You're a doubter. You never believe anything he says. But I'm thankful that Jesus, I, I, and I'll be honest, I think the reason I don't like Thomas is because I see a lot of myself in him. I know we have no doubters in the room. Look at that. Old ribbon like an old Pentecostal hanky right there. There's <laughs> glory on that. Hobby Lobby. <laughs> just Whatever works, dude, I just do it. You know what I'm saying? Where were we? Yeah, doubting Thomas. But I struggle with doubt sometimes, don't you? Y'all struggle with doubt? Y'all ever lose sight of Jesus in your life? It seems like we see him real clearly on the mountaintop. And we want to build a tabernacle like when Jesus unveiled his glory to Peter, James, and John. They saw Elijah, they saw Moses, and they saw Jesus and all of his power. And Simon Peter, again... Same dude, always running his mouth. Simon Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Right? We always want to build, we want to build monuments on the mountaintops. But then we get down low in the valley and we lose sight of him and we begin asking questions like, man, is this thing even real? Did I just buy into some kind of nonsensical sales pitch? Am, am, I, am I duped? Is this book even believable? Can I trust in this Jesus that supposedly 2,000 years ago was here and died for me and exonerated my sin. Can I really trust all this? Can I believe him? And look, Thomas doubted, and Thomas saw him feed the multitudes, and Thomas saw him open the eyes of blind Bartimaeus, and Thomas witnessed Jesus as he performed miracle after miracle, and he still struggled with doubt. So don't be surprised when the enemy brings doubt up in your mind, especially in dark seas, and especially when storms seem to surround you in these ominous clouds block out the glory and the light of the faith that you once had and held so strongly don't worry about that because God will give you confirmation even in your seasons of doubting and he gave Thomas needful confirmation when he when he showed him his hands and his feet and I'm thankful one day we're going to see the hands and the feet of Jesus the only thing made by man in heaven are the scars and the hands and the feet of Jesus it's the only thing made by man that's in heaven my dad and a couple of y'all other guys used to sing a song about that, right? But he revealed himself to Thomas, and he gave him peace, and he gave him comfort, insomuch that Thomas said, I don't, look, I know what I said. I know what I said, but I don't need to touch the nails, the prints. I don't need to touch your side. You're my Lord. You're my God, and I'm going to go on believing in you. And so in the second appearance that he made to his disciples, he gave them a needful confirmation. But I want you to notice this. The third time, there's a nuanced commission. All right, now it's time to get busy, right? Let's get busy. It's time to get busy. Only 90s kids would get that reference, all right? Look in chapter 21 and verse number 15. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And what's he talking about? Well, again, Simon Peter is the guy that said, I'm going back to work. I'm going to go fishing again. I'm going to start doing what I do. Didn't work out well, didn't catch a cotton-picking thing, fished all night, not a bite, right? Jesus shows up, 
tells them what to do. They obey a simple command. He reveals himself. They understand it's Jesus. Peter put his shirt on because he was out there fishing with his shirt off, swims to shore, and, uh, and, they, and they're there. And then they're in the, in the presence of Jesus. And then Jesus begins this, this conversation with Simon Peter. And here's how he starts it off. He says, he says, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than these, the, these stupid, smelly fish? I understand stupid, smelly fish smell like money to him. <laughs> right? Smelly fish smell like money. I had an old boy as a hog farmer. He said, you smell that? I said, yeah, it stinks. He said, no, that's money, right? Hog farm, y'all been a hog farm? All right, whatever. Fish equal money. So when Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, do you love me more than these? He said, do you love me more than you like making money? Do you love me more than you love what you know? Do you love me more than you love your comfort zone? Do you love me more than just dwelling in this same realm, in this same headspace that you've always been in? Have you learned enough from me now, Simon, that you can trust me? Do you love me more than these? And then Simon Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Now the third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Man, Peter was aggravated at this point because he said the third time, by the way, I get people asking me a lot what Bible version I read out of. I don't even know because whatever version I read out of, I'm altering it as I'm reading it. I'm reading from the New King James, but this is the Dudley interpretation, okay? But the third time. Simon Peter's getting frustrated, understandably so. If I answer a question twice already, don't ask me again, right? You ask me something twice, I answer the same question two times, and you're asking me the third time. I understand who you are, Jesus, but enough is enough, right? So the third time, Jesus said, do you love me? And, and, and G- Peter said, Lord, you know all things. Again, you've asked me this question twice, and let's be honest, you didn't need to ask me in the first place because you've got all knowledge. Remember that little characteristic Jesus? You can read our minds. You don't need to ask any questions. You know what I was thinking before I thunk it. So you know, you know everything. You know it all. Why are you asking me this? You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Again, bad enough you asked me the same question three times. You then give me this, am, this sort of ambiguous response. Then I don't know what it means. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, blah, blah. What? I don't get what you're saying, Jesus. Well, it is pertinent what, what, what Jesus said to him, but, but, the, but the deeper meaning is contained in the usage of the words, the verbiage, the dialogue back and forth between Simon Peter and Jesus because they were using two different words, whereas our English word love, it's, it's love, but in Greek, if you look it up in the Greek, they were using two different words. So when, when Jesus said, now follow me, it's the only part that you're going to have to use your brain for a second. Most everything else is on the bottom of the shelf, but... Use your, use your brain for a second with me. The first, when Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? The word love that Jesus used is the Greek word agape. The word agape means selfless, self-sacrificing, giving and receiving nothing in return kind of love. That's what agape love is. Agape love is John 3, 16 love. For God so loved. The, the word is agape. For God so agape loved the world with a self-sacrificing, selfless, grace-filled love, giving and receiving nothing in return kind of love. That's the kind of love that God gives. So when Jesus asked the question, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, do you agape? Do you love me with a selfless, self-sacrificing kind of love? Simon Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but he used a different word. He used the word in the Greek is phileo. 
Phileo love is like what, uh, think of a city that we, that we get this word. The root word phileo is where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So when Peter answered the question, he sort of answered, but he sort of didn't answer. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me with a selfless, self-sacrificing, a giving and receiving nothing in return kind of love? He said, you know that I love you like a brother, bro. I, I love you in this sort of, you know, this give and take, this reciprocal kind of love. You know, I'm here for you, you're here for me, and you know what I'm saying? Because I love you that way. I love you in, in, in the best way that I can possibly love you. I don't know what else to tell you, but, but I love you, Jesus. Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, second time, do you agape me? Do you love me with a self-sacrificing, selfless, giving and receiving nothing in return kind of love? Simon Peter said the second time, he said, I phileo you. I've got this love for you that, hey, I love you in return for what you've done for me. What do you want me to say? I mean, you kind of started this thing. You called me out, and I'll be honest with you. I love you because you've been here for me. That's what brotherly love's like, right? You're my ride or die. Like, we're going to do everything together. We're going to keep. But, but, but Jesus was digging deeper. He wanted something more. And so then the third time, y'all follow me? I told you this is the only intellectual piece of this sermon. Y'all follow so far? I'll get my flannel graph out if you don't. All right? We'll get all techie on you. The third time, Jesus says to him, Simon, son of Jonah, and then Jesus flips the script. He said, do you phileo me? He changes it up, and he says, do you, do you love me? And that's when Peter said, you got me, right? You caught me. I love you the best I know how to love you. I can't love the way you love Jesus. Your love is deeper than mine will ever be. And so Jesus, the third time, gets on his level. And here's what I get out of that. Maybe this ain't the right interpretation. Go read somebody else. They're probably right. I'm probably wrong. But here's what I get out of it. I think Jesus is saying to Simon Peter, well, then just give me what you've got. I get it. I get it. Simon, I'm not asking you to do more than what you can do. I'm asking you to give me the best that you have. And if what you have is phileo love, it's okay. I'll take it. But here's how, you, here's how you express that love for me. Take care of my people. Love people. Now watch, this goes, this goes much deeper. It goes much deeper. Because in verse number 19, Jesus concluded his conference with Simon with these two simple words. Look in verse 19. If you have a red letter edition, you'll see it very easily. He said, follow me. Now, Peter understood what that meant, because that statement was a reflection on the first time that Jesus ever spoke directly to Simon Peter. By the way, the first time Peter met Jesus, he was fishing. Jesus found him right in the middle of everything he knew. He came to him, and he called him out. Notice this in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, I think you can take that statement, okay? That's a very famous statement. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. It's a very famous Christian statement, isn't it? But I think you could take that statement and apply it to whatever you do. It's fluid. Follow me and I will teach you. If you're a mechanic, I'll teach you how to, how to fix people's lives. And not torque down the bolt on the oil pan too tight for a poor white redneck boy that can't afford to pay for oil changes anymore to unscrew it next time. All right, never mind. If you are whatever your vocation is, I believe you could apply what Jesus said to Simon Peter to what you do. Follow me and I'll take what you know and teach you how to use that to impact lives. Follow me and I'll take what, what you're good at. I'll take your gifting. I'll take your talents. I'll take your abilities and show you how to use that to impact the lives of other people. 
And so when Jesus made that statement to Simon Peter, he was essentially saying to him, let's not forget why you got into this in the first place. I know you love to fish. You're good at it. But don't you realize there's more to you than that? There's more to you than cleaning fish. There's more to you than driving a nail. There's more to you than driving a truck or doing what you do. He said, don't you remember why you followed me to begin with? Simon, follow me and I'll add depth and meaning to your life. I'll show you why I made you. I'll show you the cosmic purpose, why you live in this world and why you've experienced all that you've experienced to this point. He said, I want to take your life and add meaning to it, Simon. And as I look around this room this morning in each of you, I see two things. I see power and I see purpose. Whether it's potential, whether it's kinetic, I can almost definitely tell you that God has placed power in you for an eternal purpose. You have gifts, you have talents, you have abilities that have been given to you by God himself. Enjoy them, use them, but don't lose sight of the fact that what you have is not yours to hold. God didn't give it to you for you to keep it. God didn't give you that talent for you to bury it and hold on to it. Now watch this. Here's how this all weaves together. Introduction number two is now completed. And we're moving into sermon mode. Because I want you to notice in verse number 25, I love how the Gospel of John ends. Verse 25, it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did. Which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. In other words, the whole world could not contain the volumes of books that it would take to pin down all that Jesus did and all that Jesus would do. So God began writing his story in you. God began writing his story in you. That's heavy, and I'm letting it simmer because I want you to realize the handiwork of God couldn't be held in all the libraries and all the shelves and all the clouds and all the databases known to mankind. It couldn't contain what Jesus would do. So Jesus created you. Now watch. There's another verse that verifies what I just said. I didn't make it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 2 says, You are our letters written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. You're a letter written by Jesus, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. He said God didn't use paper to write the second half of his story. He's using you. You are the next chapter of his book. You're the next chapter of the book that God is writing. And this morning, God is calling you to level up. It's time to step into a new dimension, not just a new dimension of time called 2022, but a new dimension of purpose. It's time to realize that your life, everything in your life has a meaning. Everything in your life has happened for a reason, and God has brought it all together to this point right now, and he's writing a story in your heart and in your life. Now watch this. Here's the summary, and we're finished. In chapter 21, in verse number 20, again, I say this often, so y'all just, just hang on, but this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It is right now. I love this. It's hilarious. It says, then Peter, turning around. Now remember, Jesus just got done. He just got done with this conversation with Simon Peter. You love me more than these? Yeah, Lord, you know, right? That whole thing we already went through. He just finished that. And then in verse 20, Peter turned around, saw the disciple 
whom Jesus loved following him. When you read that statement in the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, it's a reference to John himself. He never wrote about himself in the first person. He always wrote in this, in this way, the disciple whom Jesus loved. From John's estimation, there was no higher, higher title he could give to himself than being someone that Jesus loved. And so he's writing about John, or rather he's, he's, he's looking back, and he sees John following Jesus, and it says this, this is the same disciple who leaned on Jesus' breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one that betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Now, Jesus just commissioned Simon Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep, my sheep, right? He just got done telling Simon Peter what to do. Now, brother, Peter looks back and sees John and goes, well, what's, 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 uh, what's John get to do? I know what you said about what I'm going to do, but what about John? Jesus said in chapter 21, verse 22, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, dude, mind your own freaking business. Mind your business. I just gave you a job, right? Right? I just revealed my purpose in creating you. And you're worried about what John's doing. Why don't you mind your business and follow me? <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> In verse number 23, then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. <laughs> Seriously, dude? Jesus said, now, y'all get it, right? You understood what he said. If I, it, hey, if I desire that he stays here till I return, what's, 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 what's it to you? And then from that moment, Simon Peter went around saying, hey, John's going to live till Jesus comes back. From that moment on, he started this little tradition, this legend, that John would live and not die. Till Jesus returned, and it says in the middle part of verse 23, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, in conclusion, I want to say this to you. When you decide to follow Jesus, now, now Mayor, keep in mind, that, that following Jesus and being saved are two different things. Being saved is receiving a gift, just like Christmas time. Being saved is receiving a gift. It's what Jesus did for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty, and he stood in the courtroom of judgment on our behalf. And to be saved, all we do is receive that gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is a gift received. But following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, making the conscious decision that I'm not just going to be a Christian in name, I'm going to try to live this thing out. I may not have all to offer that some people have to offer, and I may not love Jesus as much as I ought to love Jesus, and I might doubt sometimes, and I might ask questions sometimes, and I might slip up sometimes, but I'm going to do my dead level best to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. Being a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean you're batting a thousand, doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're doing your dead level best with your whole heart to follow Jesus. And when you do that, when you choose to follow Jesus, You'll be misconstrued and often misunderstood. Look, man, Simon, Peter, and John, they were like compadres. They were close. Peter misunderstood John, repeated stuff about him that wasn't true, started a rumor. Wasn't a real bad rumor, but he started a rumor, didn't he? And I want you to understand that following Jesus doesn't mean people are always going to get you. Stop trying to live your life so that people get you. Matter of fact, start living a I don't really give a crap whether they get me or not kind of life. Because until you divorce yourself from public opinion, 
and realize that the only thing that matters is that you are following Jesus. Hey, Simon, what do you care what John does? What do you care? You follow me. Keep your eyes on me. Get your eyes off the other disciples. Stop worried about what they're doing. Stop being in competition with these other people and these other churches and trying to be better than them. Stop it. Stop worrying about that. What do you care? We're on the same team. Why would you care? Listen, if you, if, you study, if you study the relationship between Simon Peter and the Apostle John, man, there was this one-sided competition always going on. Always. Man, Simon Peter was always trying to outdo, outdo John. Even John chapter 20, resurrection day, Jesus rises from the dead. It says Simon Peter and John run to the tomb, and it says the other disciple outran Peter. Man, it aggravated him. They were in a foot race to get to the tomb. And John knew Peter's character, so John got to the tomb. The Bible says he just stooped down and didn't go in. He let Simon Peter win. Way to go, brother. You outran me. Brother, Peter, man, Simon Peter was always in this one-sided competition with John. It's so, it's, I'm just so beyond that. I'm so beyond that. Well, our church is this. Our church is better. Our church is better, but we don't have to brag about that, right? <laughs> There's this level, oh, stop. But we've got to stop that. It's not a competition. And you're not competing against her or him or anybody else. You're not in competition. Stop living your life like you're in competition with people. Your only competition is you. And your job is simple. Two words. If you can't handle that job description, I can't help you. Two words. Follow Jesus. Simon Peter, hey, Jesus, what's my commission? Give me the deets, dog. Follow me. Follow me. Well, what else? Well, you'll see. You'll figure it out. All you need to do now is just take another step and follow me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you to touch people's lives. I'm going to use your hands to mend broken hearts. I'm going to use your voice to minister encouragement and healing to other people. I'm going to use you. But all you have to worry about is that you are following me. Stop looking around. Start looking up. And step into this new dimension. When following Jesus, you got to stay focused you got to stop taking advice from the cheap seats. And you got to be willing to step out in faith and give Jesus everything that you have. Let's stand together. Father, in Jesus' name we come. Lord, we pray that you would just be with us now. It's, it's not just another time of reflection and meditation. Lord, this is a time when I feel like you're calling some people out. I, in my heart, Lord, you know this is true for months now. I have felt in my heart that you were calling certain people in this place to a different calling I feel like you're bringing a shift into someone's life you might be calling somebody into ministry but I know you're calling all of us to step out and believe in you and walk by faith and Lord as we embark on this new year I know it's just the turning of the calendar as far as the measurement of time is concerned but God might we look forward to it and understand that you know the end from the beginning and you have already planned and prepared and gone before us and now we've got to follow you today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and trust you with the outcome. Lord, bless and use us. We pray that you would take what we have. Lord, even though sometimes we doubt, even though sometimes our, our hearts are a little bit fickle and we turn to the left or the right, God, help us to stay laser focused and give you everything that we have. Though it might be little, it might not seem like much, God, I pray that you would take our little offering of five loaves and two fish and multiply it. Break us, Lord, that you might disperse and use our lives for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
take a seat at the table more than we could ever want. Deeply in Jesus' name, the Savior has no place. He's a living See? 